Thank you, uh, Mr. Madhav Rao, um, MSC Nandipare, Mr. Reddy. I can see a lot of my friends uh, on the other side, uh, uh, Dr. Ramu. I can even see my seniors, uh, Rukmani, and uh, so on. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today to deliver the 14th uh, Memorial Lecture in the name of uh, Mr. Samarjit Ray. Uh, we have heard some reminiscences from Mrs. Ray about uh, what uh, Mr. Ray would be uh, always talking about and thinking about. And I'm sure today we are also going to broadly discuss uh, those issues in the present uh, kind of a tradition or uh, manner in which the transformation uh, across the world is now looking up to. Uh, I think uh, is a topic of the future, I would say, because uh, the, as the title says very clearly, uh, agroecology pioneering tomorrow's uh, agriculture landscape. So let's uh, hope that tomorrow's landscape is ecologically sustainable and also economically viable. Now, having said this, uh, it also is a great pleasure for me, uh, Mr. Reddy, when you mentioned that uh, the first lecture was delivered by Mr. Reddy, the then uh, governor of the Reserve Bank of India. And I remember I was, I must say, I'm very honored and privileged to uh, be part of that series, which were started by some very well known names uh, in that uh, India Rivers. I remember recently uh, I delivered uh, the Foundation Day lecture at the Pantanagar University. And when I was told, introduced that uh, Jawaharlal Nehru delivered the first uh, foundation lecture, it gives you a tremendous uh, sense of gratification, uh, you know, to be a part of the same series of uh, speakers. Uh, that uh, why I wanted to illustrate this is because I think it's uh, the kind of privilege and honor that uh, one has been bestowed today to to uh, deliver something to the thoughts of Mr. Samarjit Ray, and I think. Uh, there can be no better way than to uh, in the in the in the uh, way in, in the lines of what mr roy said that you know uh, talking too much about agriculture would uh, brand you as an excellite uh, but today sir we are often most of us here in this room would be branded as urban nexus <laughs> there's a change, uh, there's a, certainly a change you know but uh, the trend continues and i think uh, somehow agriculture or talking about poor has been seen in that context and in that light. Well, uh, coming back to this particular issue, I remember several years back when Dr. Norman Borlaug was alive, the Nobel laureate, and I once uh, in an interview with him, I asked him a question about uh, Rachel Carlson. And you know Rachel Carlson had done that monumental work uh, on chemical pesticides, uh, say again, Silent spring. Silent spring, yes, the title of the book. And I thought I would I will bring that up to Norman Borlaug, who actually, as you all know, was the father of uh, Green Revolution. So when I mentioned that, uh, what have you to say about uh, Rachel Carlson's work, work? Because I believe Rachel Carlson was one of those pioneers who actually foresaw uh, what was going to happen to the planet uh, in the years to come. And that was a remarkable uh, in, uh, work that she did and also uh, the futuristic vision that she carried, that she could see before each one of us or, or all of us could at least uh, start thinking on those lines that what is happening to the birds, what microbes and so on and so forth. Uh, so I just asked Professor Swam, uh, Dr. Swaminathan, uh, sorry, Norman Borlaug, as to as to what he thought about uh, Rachel Carlson, and uh, you will be surprised, his answer was, she's an evil force. <laughs> these are the people, these are the people who don't want hunger to go away. And uh, these are the people who will always, uh, uh, you know, find faults with the kind of efforts that we are beginning to remove hunger. Now, he had a point, there is no denying, uh, uh, Norman Borlaug had that point, but I guess uh, today the world has woken up to what uh, Rachel Carlson had predicted uh, several decades ago. And uh, that actually has uh, 
been part of that movement that set a, a discussion or debate on the agroecological farming systems. Uh, you know, step by step, we have seen that those or these kinds of stalwarts are standing up and pointing to us that the way forward is not the way of intensive agriculture, but the way forward is of agroecological agriculture or, or farming systems. Now, this was just to give you a little bit of a background from where we are all coming and where we have landed up today. Um, we ignored the warnings at that particular time, and today we know what have we done to the planet. You know, if uh, uh, if if today the planet is in a bad shape, we when I say bad shape, means the natural resources have been destroyed, the soil is destroyed, the organic matter has almost come to zero, and we also know that know that the water table has plummeted to to dangerous uh, levels. The contamination of the entire food chain is quite evident before us. I don't have to talk about the virtues of agroecological agroecology in a hall where it is all pasted around. If you see the posters around us, are all talking about the 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 the, the way you have to uh, you know or look into the aspects, different aspects of agroecology. Now that's the kind of practitioner's job, which of course is uh, is is very important. But I think uh, let's go a little beyond to see as to where the world is now headed towards or is uh, transforming to. It is very important at this particular juncture to, to see that today the world realizes that one third of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from uh, the farming systems that we have. In fact, if uh, food wastage, we all know, was a country, then it would have been ranked number three in the world as far as greenhouse gas emissions were concerned. Similarly, we have data now for everything uh, that we know of which has been damaged or destroyed uh, uh, as, as the journey towards uh, intensive agriculture had went, uh, has gone along. But uh, one thing is very clear that the world is certainly at an age of transformation. We are, we are debating and discussing you know, whether agroecology is the future or let's not forget, there is another parallel development taking place and that is whether synthetic food is the future. So we are, we are actually lost between two areas, both going in opposite directions. One is agroecology, the other one is synthetic food. Now, this is very interesting. Only time will tell us which way we are able to move or which direction we are able to move. And I think it is here, which is very important to see the role that uh, you know, practitioners of agroecology are playing along with the kinds of policy making that is taking place in this country or globally or nationally. And where we are all driving our farmers towards. You know, when we say no farmer, no food, you know, the imagination of the farmers protest comes into our mind. But I think on the other hand, there is another transformation or transition happening, which says we don't need farmers, we don't need land, and we will still have food. So I think we need to be very clear the, 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 the kind of a division that the world is witnessing today. From one side, we want that agriculture, uh, agroecology will provide the kind of employment, will provide the kind of entrepreneurship that the world needs today so that uh, people become self-reliant and people become, as you rightly mentioned, very conscious of the kind of uh, environment that they are living in. They try to protect that environment at the same time trying to feed us. That is one way of looking at it. But the other also is saying that we are protecting the environment and we are also feeding the uh, population. So that's another way, but that may be a way which perhaps would be an extension of the kind of green revolution technology or the green revolution that we had in this country. The new green revolution that I see is headed in that direction. But I'm so glad that a lot of people across the world are much saner and come up with that thought process that is driving us to, to, to a kind of a real change that the world should be looking up to, which is the transformation or the transition to agroecology. Now, this is a division, of course, as we go along, we will talk more about it to understand where we are headed towards and where we need to put our efforts and to see that, you know, which part of that transition is what the world should be looking up to or we should be willing to take or undertake because otherwise we are we are getting fast into the hands of another uh, you know uh, you can call it new green revolution you can call it second green revolution you can call it by any name but it means that the that the world is 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 uh, divided law in fact uh, a few days back i was listening to an interview on on one of the financial uh, uh, publications international and the gentleman who was producing food in a factory in a food factory said we are actually not producing synthetic food what we are doing is that we are in the process of manufacturing land 
It took me some minutes to understand why is he in, in the process of manufacturing land. He says, because in this factory, which is as big as this particular office is concerned, he says, we are using the elements from the air, mixing it up with bacteria and producing synthetic food, uh, which, which we are supplying to the rest of the world, which means we don't which means we are in the process of manufacturing land. So here is here is the division that I think we need to start looking at it. Are we are we getting into the right kind of mode, sir, when we talk of agriculture, or we are getting into another new mode where perhaps there would be no farmers and yet there would be enough food on the table. So that's a choice that we have to make and also just to start thinking about it because I believe the, the new revolution, many call it as agriculture revolution 4.0, is, is what is now driving the development agenda. Whereas in my understanding, the world needs agriculture revolution 2.0. 2.0. You know, the, the kind of agroecological farming system that we have all talked about, which India was, of course, um, in a, whether, whether we like it or not, was, was uh, you know, something that was perfectly in, in tune with what was required. And then if that was the agriculture revolution 1.0, that's the stage we have come to. Today, we need to either move to agriculture revolution 2.0 or we need to move towards agriculture Revolution 4.0 because green revolution was taken as green the green revolution was taken as agriculture revolution 3.0. So uh, green revolution, if it is getting over, we are getting on to green revolution 4.0. We'll talk more about uh, green revolution 4 uh, 4.0, not uh, uh, when we leave behind green revolution as agriculture revolution 4.0. But at the same time, I think it is very important to come back to agriculture revolution 2.0, which is agroecology. It, it can be in different names by called by different names, whether it's permaculture whether it is, you know, the regenerative agriculture or so on and so forth. I think uh, everything is welcome. You know, we should not say we should have a uniformity here or we should have a kind of one size fits all kind of approach, you know, one nation, one agriculture. No, I think we can have multiple agricultures, all different kinds of agriculture uh, in the name of agroecological uh, agroecology that the world is looking up to. That is one way. So anyway, this divide between agriculture 2.0 and agriculture 4.0 is something which I think is, is important for all of us to start focusing our energies because sometimes what happens, we are very happy in the world that we are in and we think that is the way forward and the world is going to listen to us and then we suddenly see or we gradually see that the world is moving in another another direction. I think it becomes too late then to 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 see or to stop that march. So it is it is important. Uh, that's why I thought this will be something that we need to focus on and some dwell on and then start thinking what we can do to see how to strengthen the agriculture revolution 2.0, uh, which of course many of us believe not only here but globally also is the way forward for this planet. Otherwise, much of the planet would be very happy settling on Mars or Venus in the years to come because after having destroyed the planet, they can go away. But I think we will all be left to face the consequences. Uh, the, the, so in, in that context, I think what we have need to do is to start or look at from the what uh, we are looking at the farm or the petitioner, uh, practitioner level, then go right up to the kind of policy transformation that is taking place or in which direction it is uh, taking place. Now, this is a pathway which should be very interesting to see. And the other pathway also is very challenging for us when, when I talk about the future of agriculture revolution 2.0 or agroecology. Today, the, uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, one third of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from food systems. And uh, it has become very easy. It's, it's, it's become very easy to now reduce the gaseous emissions because uh, agriculture being a soft target, the world has begun moving to see that, you know, how to limit or restrict uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. That's the international focus today happening. Many of us who are very perturbed that in India, farmers are demanding minimum support price, they want it to be fixed and so on and so forth. And I was very happy when Mrs. Ray talked about, uh, you know, the, the, the role uh, agriculture plays in our GDP and uh, where we have come down, uh, you know, 17%, 15% and so on. And, uh, you know, on one side, the incomes are coming down and the other side, uh, we see a huge problem of uh, uh, unemployment being addressed by way of uh, strengthening agriculture if we, if we try to move towards the agroecological farming uh, systems. But I think the more important here is to understand that uh, whenever I see a debate on agroecology, I'm a little disturbed also because many of the proponents or many of the advocates will stand up and say, you know, agroecology will reduce uh, the, the input cost and which means the farmer's income will go up. 
Now that I think is not the right way to promote agroecology. When you start saying that because the input usage has gone down, the farmer's uh, income will go up, and uh, without making an effort to see that the income of farmer in any case has to go up, we are trying to keep farmers where they are or where they were. I think that status quo is not required. We need to move away. So it's not only that you know intensive agriculture would require a kind of a guaranteed income to be given to farmers. I think agroecological agriculture also requires the same kind of guaranteed income or a minimum support price, or still going further by way of what is called as ecosystem services. Prices being defined by way of ecosystem services, so that we give the genuine kind of a price to the farmer for the ecosystem services that he protects. Or the environment protection he does by going for agroecological farming systems. We can't just leave it aside and just think that just because we have taken care of the inputs now, if his income has gone up, so we should be all very happy and not, not to worry about this um, category of farmers. In my understanding, agro agroecological farming systems also need to ensure that the economic security is something that has to be ensured for agro uh, farmers who are indulging in agroecology. And this would mean you don't have to follow the same pattern of uh, income support that you are giving to farmers who are engaged in uh, intensive agriculture. But I think you need to change now or you need to look beyond what we have already done to ecosystem services. And there is, uh, as we all know, United Nations has worked out a team approach, the, the economics of ecosystem services and biodiversity, and they have worked out or it's still a kind of a science which is evolving. So, you know, the, the, the models are being perfected, the costs are being perfected, the values ascribed for agriculture or the kind of protection that they do to the environment. And that is the kind of pricing system that we need to start adopting rather than just believing that because they don't uh, apply chemical inputs and so on or the expensive inputs so we can forget about the, as far as the, their economy or their the livelihood is concerned. They, when I say their means the people who are indulging in or who are engaged in agroecological farming system. So I think uh, this is something which I don't find uh, uh, being debated at all in the, in the network that I go around in the country to, to meet farmers or to meet uh, people who are helping farmers to, to get on to agroecological pathway. But somehow the economic aspect or the economic dimension is uh, something that we cannot ignore. Now, this, this question of um, what Mrs. Ray raised earlier, that you know the poverty levels have come down, many believe. The, there is a debate already going on in India whether the poverty levels have really come down or there is a a big question mark on what has happened. But sir, I remember when Mr. Pranam Mukherjee was the, was the, uh, you know, ha heading the planning commission at one stage, the poverty level was reduced in one stroke from 37% to about 20%. And then when the new planning commission came, it restored back the the, the poverty level to that uh, situation, uh, to that position earlier. So, you know, because it is very fascinating, you can, uh, you know, say that you know, there's hardly any poverty left in India when the country is growing at the 7% and so on and so forth, not wanting to see, you know, from what Mrs. Gandhi at one time talked about Garibi Hatao, today it has become Garibi Chupao. And so we, we are in the process of, uh, you know, by way of statistical jugglery or whatever, you know, we want to hide the hide the poor from public glare. But I think uh, I wrote an article some years back, the algebra of poverty. When I wrote that article, that was the time a debate was happening whether our poverty has suddenly come down from 37% to about 20% that was projected, or it is still higher. So in my article, in the uh, which was captioned very nicely as algebra of poverty, I'd say you don't have to do all these calculations and so on. Just go to the railway platform, stand where the long distance train is coming, and just see the people who are getting out. It gives you an idea how much people have been lifted out of poverty or not. You just have to stand on the platform on the on let's say the first floor or on the overbridge and you can see the kind of masses that er come out of that train and uh, it gives you an idea what kind of poverty we are uh, settled with or stable with. Now, this is one way of uh, looking at it, but there will be other ways also of looking at uh, whether we have really done something about poverty or not. You know, the, the ac acute poverty line that existed at that time internationally, which was uh, close to $1.9, has now moved on to $2.15, which I think is again an underestimate. But even in India, uh, 
So there was a time when we were taking as a 15 rupees as the poverty line, six, 17 rupees out the poverty line. Sometimes it was 11 rupees as the poverty line. I don't remember what kind of poverty we were calculating when even chappals were cost more than what was projected as the as the poverty line. But never the line, the point interesting is, uh, Mrs. Ray, let me let me bring that to you. And what Mr. Mr. Uh, Samarjit Ray would have been a little disturbed by the kind of data that is being thrown around is uh, uh, a recent World Bank study has come out about the about the BRICS countries. And they are talking about five BRICS countries, not the 10 that we have now. It tells us, because they say India is among those, or BRICS countries are among those which are the middle income countries. So we cannot equate them with the acute poverty line. So they are treating $4 per day the population living in below that, uh, uh, you know, that particular figure of four dollars per day, which means in India, rupees two hundred eighty is is the, is the category. Now, interestingly, it is as I said, it's about five the the, the BRICS countries, the country which has the highest population which is living below two hundred eighty rupees is India. Ninety one percent of our population is living below. 280 rupees or four dollars, which means after the economic reforms came in in uh, uh, you know 1991, nine percent population has benefited. If they are, if the if the percentage or the, the figure that I am giving you or the World Bank has given to us tells us very clearly that nine percent of the population is above four dollars or living above. Uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a package of four dollars per day. Now, this is ninety-one percent. Is India tops that list? The country which is second in the list is uh, South Africa, which has about fifty percent population living below uh, four dollars, and the rest of the four uh, population, of course, is above four dollars. So, look at the gap from ninety-one percent in India to fifty percent, roughly fifty or fifty-two percent in South Africa, and you will be surprised among that entire list uh, ranking. Uh, Russia is at the top with only 5% population below $4. We may not consider much about, uh, or we don't talk very high of the Russian economy, but the fact of the matter is it's 5% population which is uh, below the uh, $4 per day uh, limit. And that I think tells you a lot about what we have achieved all these years or what we don't want to recognize that where we are today. And I think one way to pull the country out uh, which, of course, as the Prime Minister's so vision is Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, would be to, to rebuild agriculture, to make agriculture economically viable and profitable. And that is why, sir, when you mentioned that today the farmers are wanting uh, a, a minimum support price to be a guaranteed uh, price, they are... They are, they are uh, uh, they, uh, we don't want to understand uh, many of us as the debate goes on today, but I think the reality is that markets, uh, the free mantra, the free market mantra, all these years have actually failed farmers everywhere in the world. And uh, whether it is in America, whether it is India, whether it is European Union or the other rich countries, agriculture is in a, in a devastated state today. When I say devastated state today, I'm talking about the economics uh, that works out in favor of farmers. In America, the situation is so tense or so depressing that please don't think that America is the big apple that every farmer should aspire to go to America to become a farmer. In fact, in America, the, the rate of suicide in rural America is 3.5 times higher than the national average. So it tells you how severe is the distress in that part of the country. And also, if uh, if you look at uh, the kind of support farmers get are getting in America, uh, every farmer gets a support of $85,000 a year in America. In India, the support to farmers, the domestic support to farmers is about $290. So compare that if a, a farmer in India with $290 as the subsidy support or domestic support. In America, it is $85,000, which, which is the subsidy support or domestic support being given to uh, farmers there. Pull down this subsidy support and whatever remains of agriculture in America also collapses. Because in America, only 1.5% of the population today remains in agriculture. And uh, 
uh, that is also being sustained by these domestic subsidies and support systems. Otherwise, they would also be disappearing in the in the in the years to come. Now, this is not the situation only in extreme one condition, one country which is economically very powerful, but also uh, as far as the other part of the world is concerned, which is a developing country like India, which has the largest population of farming uh, under farming anywhere in the world. But also look at the European Union. European Union, of course, as you know, is a uh, is uh, is faced with the uh, farmers' protest in last few weeks, and it has started with 16 countries faced with farmers' protest. It is now uh, still happening in 12 uh, uh, countries in uh, in the European Union. The protests in um, uh, in European Union are also besides environmental regulation is also about the economics. And farmers, they're also saying exactly what our farmers are saying. In India, farmers are saying guaranteed income. They may not use the same vocabulary in in, uh, in uh, uh, European Union, but they say that we need to get an economic cost or the economic value for our produce, which means they want a, a agriculture prices to be fixed below which no trading takes place. In India, farmers are saying that the MSP should be become a legal mechanism below which no trading takes place. In America, it is being said that what American farmers are desirous of is income parity. Income parity in their language, in their vocabulary that they use or terminology they use is same like what the uh, uh, European farmers are wanting and is also equal to what the Indian farmers are wanting. The point I'm trying to make is whether it is America or whether it is India, farming is already suffering because of the free markets that I have been operating all these years. But somehow we have been drilled to believe that you know there is no other way forward but then to rely on, on markets and markets are the better judge of efficiency. They they know where the supply demand is and they will provide farmers with a with the right kind of price. But it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. I think it is time to take a real look at what the farmers are demanding and what the future entails as far as this huge and large population is concerned all over. So given this condition. We are at a crossroads today, and I, 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 you know, coming from agriculture sciences myself, and I know many have studied agriculture or economics, somehow we have been made to believe that this is the only way forward. But I think it is not Tina factor. Is the, you know, the Tina factor, as you know, there is no alternative. No, there is an alternative, and I think what Indian farmers are demanding is the alternative, and economists as well as policymakers need to understand that the farming livelihood is also very important, and it is the majority livelihood that we are talking in this uh, particular situation or in this, not only in this country, but uh, globally. Now, why I, I talked about the economics part? Because I think whether it is intensive agriculture or whether it is ecological agriculture that we are talking about or the future that awaits us, the, the, uh, the, 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 the dimension that we have continued to ignore all these years, ever since at least I was a student, is that we have not, not uh, considered what happens to the livelihood of the people who are engaged with agriculture. We just Leave them, left them to their fate or just left them to their markets. And uh, we believe that the markets will take care of uh, agriculture or uh, for farming, and it hasn't happened. So there is a, a need for a rethinking on this particular aspect. Now, agroecology, you know, as uh, the Chinese uh, president, uh, President Xi, had uh, recently in, a, in an address said that uh, if you destroy nature, the nature will come back to destroy you. And the point he was trying to make is that if you destroy nature, it will continue to come and haunt you. And this is what uh, the, uh, the world is witnessing today. I'm not sure if uh, China is adopting the right kind of policy despite making all these statements. But all I'm trying to say is people are increasingly realizing that we cannot continue to play with nature as we have been doing it all these years. In fact, I remember, you know, this again is part of our, uh, our mindset, sir, that we it has been created over the years. Sometimes back, there was a debate happening in America. An American professor wrote, is murder sustainable? I thought that was a very fascinating question. When we were talking about sustainable agriculture, the question he posed was, is murder sustainable? And then the professor wrote, yes, it is sustainable. Because sustainability means you are, you are killing less number of people, but you have a larger population still on the other side. So according to him, murder was sustainable. But it tears the social fabric apart. I think that is what is important. You know, sustainability parameters that we have been defining all these years, somehow we, we go to that level that, you know, to achieve that economic growth or the economic stature that we are looking up to or aspire to, we don't mind, uh, you know, uh, when I say uh, not only killing 
people but killing the nature and once you kill nature or destroy nature the 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 world's end is also close by so so this was what it was being discussed and at that time i used to wonder what kind of professors there uh, are are discussing is murder sustainable but i think uh, it tells us that you know the kind of mindset that we have been uh, grown with or maybe we have been made to believe that you know as long as sustainability there and you don't have to worry so you know we can go on destroying the planet till you know you believe it is not going to the brinks so that is not what actually sustainability is sustainability i think in lot many ways is what agroecology provides and agroecology provides we all know uh, it has been very clearly spelled out by many stalwarts including the fao director general and so on we saying that agroecology teaches us where with the plants uh, animals uh, birds and uh, uh, human beings and environment they learn to live in harmony i think that is what uh, basically we are trying to achieve or we are trying to portray when we talk of agroecology protecting agroecology or building up agroecology now the entire debate also boils down to another interesting uh, uh, point that is being flagged nowadays that agroecology cannot feed the world so therefore agroecology is good for you know your your hobby or 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 a niche market and so on and so forth but to produce food for the world we need to go in for intensive agriculture that's a school of thought which is of course uh, uh, building up at the same time but there are lots of people who have challenged that uh, school of thought it all began by a, by an international is international analysis that was done by both world bank and united nation it is called iwastd report which came several decades back and uh, that report tells us very clearly that uh, there is an alternative and agriculture Uh, ecological revolution provides that kind of alternative it also tells us that um, you don't have to worry about uh, for the production estimates that we are all flag the round saying the world will not be producing enough but in fact they have shown that there are ample ample evidence which shows that agroecology can produce enough food for the planet and uh, so let there be no doubt about it if you look into that particular report and if in fact you don't have to go far away you have right the, in andhra pradesh a kind of a uh, the, uh, i would say an agroecological model which in my understanding is the world's biggest or the largest model uh, that exists in andhra pradesh and it has demonstrated very conclusively how you know it has become a kind of a regeneration for the economic uh, livelihoods or the economic base has been lifted up uh, with that kind of a revolution that has taken place by way of the community manager natural farming system and i'm so happy that um, the center for sustainable agriculture uh, professor uh, dr ramu and uh, even mr reddy's involvement with all these things rukmani ji is also sitting there they all helped with uh, sort of started with the uh, you know uh, non pesticides uh, management program at one stage which has grown over the years to become community manager natural farming systems and i think it is not far away you just have to step into your next district to see what is what transform mission it has uh, brought out and also let's not be uh, you know uh, lost in that figure of uh, greenhouse gas emissions because uh, talking to the uh, community managed uh, community managed natural farming uh, people who are managing that i think it comes out very clearly some studies have shown what kind of uh, greenhouse gas emissions have been reduced as a result of moving on to that kind of a farming system so the data is abundantly available the the production statistics are also available the economic transformation is visible i remember a few weeks back when i went to uh, to the community managed natural farming systems uh, one of the discussions with them and they brought uh, the 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 <laughs> from the different districts and we had an i had an interaction with the with the people there and believe me there were about 30 40 people or women especially who had come from the lower strata when i say lower strata would mean people who had 50 cents or 70 cents of land or one acre or two acre maximum of land and i was amazed a, a lady gets up and tells us that um, her son has done the mba and her daughter is in america now the second lady tells me that her daughter has completed aeronautical engineering and and has joined isro in bangalore i am sitting in a in a middle class uh, you know one of those uh, uh, congregations and uh, but then i realized uh, when i asked her what was the land holding she was she had it was one acre the other lady is trying to make this uh, that you know this kind of coming from that kind of a society or social level is an indicator that you know what we have been made to believe is is actually something that is not uh, working out to be in a true spirit and this transformation that i see in the 
poor women or uh, coming people coming from that uh, lower strata is natural farming uh, you know is something that the country would look up to if you if you come to punjab today you will be surprised uh, the but most women that i go to attend sometimes they they also the tragic events like farmer suicides and so on is uh, is uh, and these women are mostly when they are widows uh, punjab has a a huge uh, population of uh, i would say very tragic uh, incidents happening that farmers are committing suicide in a state which is the most prosperous in the country you know it 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 is interesting to see or draw a kind of a linkage here punjab is the state which has uh, the highest productivity not only in india but among the top 5 countries in the world punjab would rank somewhere when i say punjab would rank somewhere the productivity from wheat and paddy crop rotations just two crops uh, that they are, they are familiar with mostly familiar with per year, every year you know the uh, the productivity is 11 tons per hectare Now, eleven tons per hectare is one of the best in the world, and with that, you would see, oh, the farmers must be very progressive, or farmers must be doing very well. But the reality is, at the same time, Punjab has now turned into a hotbed of farmer suicides. So, on the one hand, we have such a uh, such a uh, remarkable performance as well productivity is concerned, and don't forget, Punjab has ninety nine percent of the irrigation. No country in the world has ninety nine percent of their cultivable lands under irrigation, and uh, despite that, you know, Punjab has become a hotbed of farmers. Between two thousand and two thousand fifteen, it has a record of. Uh, Sixteen thousand farmers committing suicide, farm and farm workers committing suicide. But when you come to the community managed natural farming system, you realize ever since the program began, there has not been a suicide in that particular region, which tells you here is a kind of a model which is more sustainable and more economically viable. It hasn't uh, uh, pushed pushed uh, farmers into the kind of indebtedness that we see all around uh, happening in the in the in the intensively cultivated uh, areas. So the point I'm trying to make is here is another advantage that. Uh, Agro ecological farming system throw up, and I think this is a kind of a social transformation which is required. The other transformation, I think, uh, I hope agro ecology also addresses. Uh, Mr. Reddy and uh, others can can perhaps look into it. When I go around the country, I find the younger boys are not finding a bride. If the situation has reached such a level, whether I am in Punjab or whether I am in Kerala or in Gujarat or Maharashtra or in Andhra Pradesh, younger boys are not getting brides. and i often ask them what has gone wrong why are the uh, you know parents not willing to send their girls uh, you know as brides in these areas and of course you would understand the answer but this was not only confined to india i asked to farmers in france uh, you know are your boys getting married they said no 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 i am you i'm we are so glad that you asked the, uh, this question because despite the huge subsidies being pumped into european agriculture the boys are not getting married so i asked them what is going wrong why are your boys not getting married when you have so much of subsidies coming uh, you know into your family and so on well they had no answer but they said somehow there is a kind of a social disconnect which i think we must appreciate that everything is not seen in the terms of money and the economics but i think there is a social disruption and we see that this is not happening in fact the french taught me or told me that the biggest crisis has started happening when we started producing surplus Now that is something we don't realize you know when the when the intensive agriculture the focus was on producing surplus because that is what the what the grain companies were wanting to trade across the world so we went on increasing surplus or producing surplus the result is the prices started crashing when the prices started crashing the farmers were out of agriculture but the companies gained so the company stock markets have gone up the farmer stock market has gone down and one of the ways to evaluate the stock market for agriculture would be whether the boys are getting married or not <laughs> and i think that is that is uh, some part of uh, the social uh, milieu that i think we need to look around and anyway they, i was told a very interesting fact came up they said there is a, 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 a television show a reality show in france which is called love in the field it's a weekly show where the boys and you know the television channel tries to bring girls and boys onto the same stage and encourages the girls to go and stay in the villages hoping that one day they will start uh, or they will settle down there so that's a kind of effort so when i went to this television channel to ask them you know how long have you been doing this program and so on and i 
I only hope that Salman Khan, if he's listening to this particular talk on the Zoom, perhaps he should he should move away from yes boss to at least getting our boys married uh, in the rural areas. I think that would be a big contribution to this country's uh, uh, social demography or the kind of uh, demographic situation we are in. Anyway, I was told when I went to that um, read, uh, the television company, they said, why are you only looking at us? There is a, a similar kind of a program in Scotland. So I checked up with Scotland. They said there's a similar kind of program in Canada. Now, the point I'm trying to make is whether it is Punjab or Kerala or whether it is France or Canada or, you know, wherever in the world, this social milieu is the same. The social disruption that I talked about because of the kind of farming systems that we have evolved over the years is before us. I don't think we want to lead to a world where the, you know, the, 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 the rural areas become completely devoid of a kind of a family traditions that we have built or successfully built I say, around the globe. So that's a factor that we need to also start looking into when we're trying to promote agroecology. When agroecology comes in, I'm sure we will get away from that habit of producing surpluses. And the moment you get away from producing service, uh, surpluses, everything becomes survival. I think that is something we need to encourage. Please get away from the from the thinking that we have to produce surplus. And the, the surplus phenomena has shown to the world where we have uh, landed, whether it is economic or whether it is the social uh, kind of a milieu that, that the world today is uh, grappling with or trying to find an answer to it. Uh, given this kind of a situation, uh, there then finally comes the kind of a thrust that the world is uh, uh, trying to not only ascertain, but also trying to see where, where the policymakers can see the future lies. That is where I think we need to be cautious. And that is where I was trying to tell you the the, the difference between agriculture revolution 2.0 and agriculture revolution 4.0. Now, European Union has taken a very important uh, important step. What it has done in, in the new common agriculture policy, as you know, common agriculture policies is, is uh, provides the or makes provision for the kind of agriculture subsidy support that the European Union provides to its agriculture. Now, common agriculture policy, this uh, particular year, uh, from right from the month of January, Europe has started providing about $240 billion for ecological systems, which includes uh, ecological farming systems. Now, it was very good initially to look that Europe is going for a transformation. But the moment this kind of a pattern was announced and evolved and then announced and so on, you know, there is a huge backlash happening in Europe. So the companies are forcing the, the governments or the European Commission to step back and not to enforce it. And the recent farmers' protest is also talking about the, the environmental regulations that have gone astray or that has been tightened, and they want that to be relaxed. In fact, the, the protesting farmers had gone to the European Commission and have forced the European Commission to drop the pesticide regulations that were being enforced in the in, in European Union. So all I'm trying to tell you is that this kind of a pressure is also is being uh, asserted. The result being that you know we are withdrawing from the kind of environmental regulations that were tightened. The globe was moving in that direction that we need to move towards agroecological farming systems. And though, therefore, we need these kinds of regulations and so on and so forth. But again, they have taken a step back. It hasn't ended there only. You have to understand that in Europe, a new war has started. A new war, I call it a new war because it's an assault on the farming systems. You know, Holland is one country which you all know is agriculture country and it is the second biggest agriculture exporter in the world. Now, Holland has given notice or has actually pushed out 3,000 farmers from agriculture. They are saying that uh, uh, these intensively farmed lands are the ones which are adding on to global warming. And so the, the way out is to push farmers out so that you know they can reduce greenhouse gas emission. So what started off in uh, in Holland? Holland has about eleven thousand farms. You know, it's a very small country. It has about eleven thousand farms, out of which three thousand farms they have removed, and they have even ensured that these farmers don't go to another another European country and start farming there. So that has also been banned. So that is European Union's first, uh, you know, uh, uh, assault on the, on the farming systems in Holland. But it didn't stop there. You know, Europe uh, is is of course pushing on this agenda. Uh, England for or Britain for that matter has also issued notice to five thousand farmers to move out. Then there are of course we know what the German farmers were protesting was that this government had suddenly removed. Uh, the diesel subsidies for agriculture machinery, uh, you know, saying that, you know, this is part of that uh, climate aberration that was 
responsible for and so that is have also been removed and they came back protested got back the subsidies and the farmers have gone back it is not only stopping there in new zealand which as you know is a dairy country they, they all believe and we also believe that uh, dairy cows uh, uh, emit a lot of emissions so they have imposed a tax on cattle there in, um, in new zealand as a result of which the farmers there are also leaving agriculture the point i'm trying to make is this is one way of a direct assault on on uh, the, the kind of ecological agriculture that all of us were trying to envisage or trying to project or trying to see where the world should be moving towards. But there is an assault, and I think this should be clear. But don't think that the assault is to ensure environmental protection. It is not that the president of Holland doesn't understand that his country being the second biggest exporter of agriculture, he was going to lose out if the, there is a no farmer, no food kind of a, a debate that is happening. But in reality, it is the new debate that is very fascinating to see. The focus now from food security has now moved on to protein availability. So for protein availability, you you don't need the kind of agriculture that was existing. What you need is to take out protein or to provide or to meet the protein needs. There's ample work available on this, but interestingly, the factories have come up across Europe, across the globe now, where, are, where insect cultivation is being encouraged. Millions of insects are reared. You take out the protein out of it, and that protein becomes your food now. So this is a new, uh, you know, agriculture revolution 4.0. And don't think that, uh, you know, it is somewhere in the imagination or one laboratory here and so on. If you, if you even have time to Google, please Google and see what kind of uh, insect factories are developing across the world. And this, this is a phenomenon which is not going to end with insects only. There is also an effort to even octopus is a, is a, is a very soft, uh, you know, uh, sea animal, and we have never heard anything about it. But the poor octopus is now also getting into commercial cultivation because the idea being to take out or extract the protein out of it. So the world debate is now moved on to protein from what we were discussing as nutritional security and so on. It is now moved on to protein security or protein availability. Now, this is not going to stop there because uh, linked with what I discussed earlier with you that, you know, at one time we are thinking of uh, producing uh, food from, from the uh, atmospheric gases and so on, or drawing elements from that and crossing with bacteria. The world's first food factory uh, has come up in Finland. And uh, that fact factory for, has already started operating since uh, January. And uh, they are producing food by, by as I said, uh, just taking out uh, the elements from the gas, uh, from the air, and then multiplying with bacteria to produce uh, food for all of us. And uh, uh, Finland being a small country, uh, it may not be of that kind of a order that India would require. But please also don't think that Finland has done it. So what? It is a far away country, which is far away from us. Uh, the fact of the matter is many of the startups in India, and they are close to your cities where you live, actually are into this kind of uh, precision farming and so on. And this is happening right across in our country. Also, the more you open up, the more you learn about where the startups are heading towards, we will realize soon when they develop a product, they would be a takeover happening from a com uh, food company, and then you will see it becomes part of that food chain. Uh, so much so is this talk about synthetic food. We, of course, heard a lot about in the last few years, but we thought it was only restricted to Google, uh, you know, trying to tell us how to make hamburgers and so on. But uh, the artificially grown food, or the kind of synthetic food that we are talking uh, has become a big industry in the world today. And uh, the government after government are now gradually thinking of giving commercial approval for the kind of food that is. Don't be surprised the next time you can walk into a, a cafe in India and you will get tea which is not made from tea leaves. You will get coffee which is not made from coffee beans. And if you think I'm joking, you will have to do a little bit of research as Ravish normally says on television, Kush to aap bhi kariye. <laughs> you also do some research. Don't think that I'm going to give you all the information. Please do some research and you will find uh, an ample, ample literature available on this kind of development, these kinds of developments that are taking place. Now, you can just wish it away or you can just wash it away. But there are 270 food factories which have been set up. And these are getting into commercial production now. And most of these are in those countries where people have money, but they have no food or their cultivation of food is restricted. You know, countries like Singapore or Hong Kong and so on, that is where most of these food factories are becoming. 
become uh, operative. So the point I'm trying to make is if that if it is happening in that part of the world, you don't have to think about you know Hamare Desh Meto Kisan Bhote, you know, we have such a huge population of farmers, so Yaha Kushni Hoga. It is as I said earlier, you know, it is happening right in your neighborhood also. America has recently approved a synthetic chicken. Now it has a few, it, it has something that you need all to think about it. When synthetic uh, chicken comes into the market, it means the poultry industry is not required. So uh, not only it, it uh, brings you into a kind of a, a corporate driven food system uh, habit, but it also ensures that the livelihoods that were dependent on uh, poultry production will just gradually disappear as that food becomes a little more uh, accessible. Because at the moment it may be expensive, but gradually it is going to become cheaper. And I think I won't even know whether the governments will provide subsidy to make it cheaper, you know, uh, under a rational program for food or whatever, as we say, Food Security Act and so on. We don't know. But the point of, I'm trying to make is this is where the world is heading towards. So the, 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 the battle is very uh, nearly late before us. It is It will depend upon us whether we need to move towards agroecology, and that will be a, a factor which will be determined by, by, by the consumer. And on the other hand, we have the other system where we know that we are moving towards a commercial uh, system for a synthetic food. And don't be surprised. You can say, no, no, I won't like it. You know, people who go to those food factories, the insect factories, and try to, uh, you know, take a bite of the kind of food they, have, uh, they provide there, uh, you know, and people say, oh, fascinating. What a kind of food, you know, it's so crunchy. And I don't know all these terms that you use. And I'm sure in India, when we will have a film actress uh, promote uh, this uh, particular food here and that particular food uh, there, you will all love it. And you will say that is what we need now. So with the driven or in combined with that kind of, a, a, you know, uh, the kind of uh, marketing initiatives that that we can all hope i'm sure when the film stars start doing it you will all say any i don't know even cricketers might start saying this gives me protein or this gives me more energy and uh, you know it, it's not only going to be boost your energy driver maybe the next driver would be the kind of uh, insect farming that we are doing and uh, let me tell you one chocolate in india has already started uh, having that component of protein in it so, so unless you read the label very carefully, you will never get to realize uh, what you are eating. So I think it is time for all of us to start thinking on those lines also. My point of discussing this in, a, in an event we are discussing agroecology is that don't think that agroecology looks to be all hunky-sundry or so on and it all seems to be bright. No, it is, it is on the one hand, uh, you know, facing a kind of a initiative which may eventually kill agriculture and that is something that uh, we need to so the so the choice is before us whether we want agroecological kind of farming system to be to, to sustain or we are happy with the kind of synthetic food or the kind of uh, foods that are being produced based on the kind of protein requirement of a human body, uh, if that is the kind of food that we are happy with. There would be many in this country like people who are opposing or who are uh, saying that uh, MSP, uh, the legal right is not required, it will destroy farming and destroy agriculture. There would be many people at that time also who will start building up this narrative that we don't need to destroy environment, we don't need to destroy biodiversity by crop cultivation and so on, so we need to move towards synthetic food. There would be a kind of a, a, a section of the population which will, which will be more louder than all of us. And I think it is time to take our, make our choice, whether you like this side, Agriculture Revolution 2.0, or you like Agriculture Revolution 4.0. The choice is yours, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I think, uh, finally, I have uh, just one suggestion to make. We know the stance of agroecology. We know what it means for the planet. We know what it means for the human health. We know what it means for environmental production and so on and so forth. But... The future of agroecology, where it becomes the kind of a popular or the kind of a you know agriculture lands up a landscape for the future, would depend upon the consumers. If agriculture revolution or the green revolution or the agriculture revolution 3.0 was the handiwork of farmers, we all know that they did a, they put up a remarkable show. They converted a food deficit country into a food surplus country, and we all appreciate that and acknowledge that. Now that revolution was brought about by farmers. The future revolution, whether it is agroecology or whether it is agriculture revolution 4.0, will be brought about by consumers. The next time when we meet here, or the or let's say fourth or fifth uh, memorial lecture uh, in the series later, uh, you know, and if you are still grappling with 
the kind of unhealthy food uh, which is uh, being pushed down our throat, please don't blame anybody. Don't blame the governments. Don't blame the companies. Blame yourself. Because the next revolution will depend upon the consumers. If you demand the right kind of food, you will get that food. If you demand or you are happy with synthetic food, you will get the synthetic food. So the choice is yours. If you are unhealthy or claiming that you are unhealthy because of the kind of food you eat, please don't have a, a, a kind of a deliberation or session where you say that government ki policy ne ye nahi kiya, government ki policy ne wo nahi kiya. Blame yourself that you kept quiet, you did not raise your voice, so you are now being served a kind of a food which you don't like. That is because of your own inaction. Now that is something which each one of us have to imbibe in her or herself or in him. Otherwise, please stop doing that, you know, this is wonderful or that is wonderful because the markets, the way the markets will sway that kind of a decision making is going to be very important. And many of us finally end up, when I, I realize often when I go, sir, I am just one person or I'm, you know, individual, what can I do? How can my, I, can, I raise my voice or how can that product be, 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 let's say, become a kind of a popular product or popular food product if, unless the government uh, comes with a policy design or something like that? No, I think you need to learn. And I think uh, even those who are in, 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 in uh, kind of uh, the marketing setups that we have set up, uh, we see the FPOs and other bodies uh, uh, which are already operating and trying to promote that kind of a healthy food, I think uh, have to learn from the story of Nirma. I don't know how many of you know the story of Nirma. Nirma is that soap, washing soap. When the, when the company uh, had just started operating, they didn't have the money to, to, to sponsor a cricket match and so on. Now, they didn't have the money to go for other kind of advertisements that normally we see the companies indulging in. Uh, you know, bring uh, Sachin Tendulkar to say you know, one thing and give a message about the other product. What they did was something something which I thought was, uh, was something which is, uh, as we say that, you know, we have to show some kind of ingenuity or some kind of uh, uh, interest or sometimes proactive kind of a position. You know, they realized that it, it's a very difficult market. So what they did was every corner in a city, you will find boys who are unemployed and just toiling around and doing nothing. And they picked up, they would pick up four or five boys in one corner, pick up four or five boys in another corner. Their only job was to go to the next shop, ask him, Nirma hai? Hmm. You know, what is Nirma? Are, paas ye soap hai? Main to nirma lene aaya tha. So one chap goes away, the other comes and says, Nirma hai? Create. And the same answer. By the evening, four or five people have come into the shop and the shopkeeper realizes that Nirma must be very important. So next day, all shops had Nirma supplies. So I think we have to learn that art, you know, try to go and ask for agroecological food, try to ask for healthy food and safe food. The more you ask that shopkeeper will be forced to really bring that, uh, you know, or uh, answer your that query that you post. So why I'm saying is that consumer uh, has to take a decision now. You can't just leave it to farmers is because farmers may be, may be under the assault from both the sides. But I think you have, if you take a call which is rightly in the same direction or in the earnest kind of a direction that you think is important, then only a change will come. So it is very important if you want to strengthen agroecology, I think you have to talk about the agroecological products and talk about safe and healthy foods, talk about protecting environment and so on and so forth. And that is what will bring about the change. But if you keep quiet like you do now, I think we are going to lose out. So my, my uh, advice to people all across the country who are into agroecology, who swear by agroecology in the sense they realize that this is the way forward, I think you also have the other responsibility of taking on becoming the ambassador for, for that agroecological food that you produce. You don't have to wait for Ashwarya Rai or somebody else to come and eat for your voice. I think you have to be your own Ashwarya Rai, you have to be your own Salman Khan and so on and so forth. So this is where agroecological movement of the future, um, you know, the future of agroecological movement will depend. And I have a feeling that in this country, if we begin to realize, or this comes into our, uh, uh, you know, uh, thinking, I think we have the opportunity. We have also the kind of a uh, 
availability to see that that revolution that we are all looking forward to becomes the kind of a national or the kinds of a national call everywhere in this country and also internationally. So let's begin by uh, with ourselves. We should start up and talk about the virtues of agroecological system to the kind of a dominant in, in, in a form that the dominant economic thinking is swayed by what you are saying. You just can't leave it to others that they will bring about the change. I think you have to be the change now. And that is what Mahatma Gandhi said, that if you really want to change the world, you have to the change first to yourself. So if you try to become that change or the kind to be trying to become a kind of a, a advocate or the kind to become a kind of a spokesperson, then only that change will come about. So producing food, a healthy food is one task, but uh, marketing that produce, please don't leave it to others, take it on yourself. And I think that is where uh, agroecology will change. The, the way the future agriculture or the way we are trying to see where does the agriculture move in what directions and so on. So ladies and gentlemen, finally to end, I think uh, we have discussed a couple of areas or matter of areas and, and also the, 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 the uh, specific conditions under which agriculture ecology should be uh, you know moved towards because what I'm worried about is that when more people start up saying that, you know, oh, Moving on to agriculture ecology also addresses income security. I'm a lot, lot worried. And I think uh, we need to change that discourse or we change, need to bring in that kind of a debate into this agroecological farming systems because we would like to see the future farmers who are not only uh, you know, pro pro producing um, safe and healthy food or protecting environment and so on, but also becoming in the process economically viable and uh, prosperous. We cannot leave it to the way we get left uh, farming to the uh, face the future with the kind of um, markets dependence. Markets have failed farmers everywhere. Second time, we cannot allow markets to destroy agriculture. The same way we destroy the kind of uh, <clears throat> Intensive agriculture everywhere in the world, or in or what intensive agriculture has the way it has destroyed farming everywhere in the world, and uh, that would be the message which I feel needs to be be emerging out, and that is a message which I think will lead to a change that we all aspire to. So thank you very much for this patient hearing. Thank you very much.